This film briefly rips off Star Wars and hopes nobody will notice since it's only been two years before showing a crew aboard a spacecraft. They're basically normal people. Wait, what are these guys doing here? I don't know. So you got Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, Black Guy, you all know will die, Ash, played by the British guy from Brazil, Kane, played by John Hurt, Dallas, played by Tom Skerritt, and some other expendable characters you don't really care about. Their ship, called Mother, and just in case you forget, they mention it enough times for you. Mother wants to talk to you. Mother's in her room. Mother says the sun's coming up in 20 minutes. Mother hasn't identified it. Mother's deciphered part of it. I've got access to Mother now. Mother! It just sounds so stupid, it's like listening to Bobby Boucher. Mama said, mama mom said, my mama said, you should know. So Mother spots a nearby warning signal and accidentally mistakes it for a distress signal. Smart computer you got there. And stops to help out the nearby life form, damaging itself on the landing. As some of the crew fix the ship, the others go to investigate. This is completely enclosed and it's full of enemies. So Kane is attacked by the face rapist 1000, but they can't seem to detach it. Instead, it just dies on its own, but then Kane awakens and I guess he had a vision of what had become in many decades to come in the WWE and decided to off himself instead. <laughs> the alien is then on the loose and starts picking apart the crew one by one until Ripley sets the ship on self-destruct and escapes on the escape shuttle, but it's followed her on there until she gives a big fuck you and kills it anyway to end the movie with her leaving for her journey home. You got that? The film began when Dan O'Bannon, while studying cinema at the University of California, made a sci-fi comedy with John Carpenter called Dark Star. The film made O'Bannon want to make an alien that actually looked real, so a few years passed before he started working on a similar premise, but horror being the primary focus this summer round. Meanwhile, his co-writer Ronald Shusett was working on an early draft of a tiny film you may have heard of called Total Recall. Total fucking shit. He was impressed by the aforementioned Dark Star and contacted O'Bannon to work together. They both agreed to do Alien first as it would be a lot cheaper to make. Will you say that again? It was originally titled Memory with the exact same concept that we saw, but he was still unsure about where to take the whole alien Idea. O'Bannon soon started working on Dune, which had him work in Paris for six months, but it fell through. He did, however, meet several artists who inspired him for this picture, specifically H.R. Giger. I found Giger's work disturbing. His paintings had a profound effect on me. I had never seen anything that was quite as horrible and at the same time as beautiful as his work, and so I ended up writing a script about a Giger monster. What else? Another idea was to have gremlins infiltrate a B-17 bomber during the Second World War, which led to the idea of the alien implanting its embryo and bursting out as we saw in the final film. And we'll get to that. O'Bannon did confess that he used other material for the film's inspiration. I didn't steal Alien from anybody. I stole it from everybody. The thing from another world inspired the idea of professional men being pursued by a deadly alien creature through a claustrophobic environment. Forbidden Bannock gave me the idea of a ship being warned not to land and then the crew being killed one by one by a mysterious creature when they defy the warning. Planet of the Vampires contains a scene in which the heroes discover a giant alien skeleton. There was Junkyard, a short story where a crew lands on an asteroid and discovers a chamber full of eggs and even Strange Relations by Philip Jose Farmer covers alien reproduction. I even various EC Comics horror titles carrying stories in which monsters eat their way out of people. Oh sure, but everyone shits on Independence Day for stealing stuff from other films. Yeah, 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 I, I hate this planet. Will you just listen to the man? After the screenplay was completed, the duo pitched the script as Jaws in Space to several studios before finding a deal with Brandywine who had ties with 20th Century Fox. However, the studio weren't too happy and made many rewrites to the script which did not set well with O'Bannon or Shusa. They weren't good at making it better or in fact at not making it worse. They were just attempting to justify taking my name off of the script and claiming it as their own. The rewrites that they did make will we'll go on to later because yep, they are so fucking stupid. You gonna do what? 20th century we were a bit weary about funding the film at first, but after the success of Star Wars just two years prior, science fiction was red hot and they greenlit it with a budget of $4.2 million. During pre-production, O'Bannon naturally assumed that he was gonna be directing, but Fox had other plans. Walter Hill, one of the douches who made the rewrites, was approached, but declined due to other projects, as well as being uncomfortable with the amount of special effects needed. Peter Yates, Jack Clayton, and Robert Aldrich were all considered, but O'Bannon and his team felt they wouldn't take it seriously and instead would treat it like a B-monster movie. Ridley Scott was approached after his debut feature, The Duelists, and he quickly accepted. He made some storyboards which Fox was so impressed with, they actually doubled the movie's budget to $8.4 million. He came up with the designs of the ships and spacesuits inspired by 2001 A Space Odyssey and Star Wars, but he was hell-bent on making it horror as opposed to fantasy, describing it as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the sci-fi world. Let's go with it. All of the characters were written as unisex, that could therefore be interchanged during the casting period. A clever concept to decrease cliche characteristics usually set for one particular gender or the other. In fact, they did this 
specifically to avoid what they called the final girl phenomena. You know, the cliche in horror movies having a woman in danger on the run from the killer and taking him on in the climax, which ironically happened anyway, despite this technique. Does anybody want to say anything? Harrison Ford was originally offered the role of Dallas, but turned it down. Peter Mayhew was offered the role of the alien, but turned it down. And Kay Lenz auditioned for the part of Ripley, but didn't get it. Veronica Cartwright herself also auditioned for that role, but instead was cast as Lambert. The part of Ripley came down to Sigourney Weaver and Meryl Streep. Weirdly, both college friends at Yale. Balaji Badagio got the part of the alien, but this was his one and only ever acting role. Yep, not even reprising it in any of the sequels. He was discovered in a pub by one of the casting directors who noticed that he was over seven foot tall with thin arms, perfect for the costume. I really regret that no one could recognize me as the alien in the film, but then again, now that I think back, there was Boris Karloff, Christopher Lee, or other successful actors who began their careers by playing grotesque monsters. The fact that I played the part of the alien, for me, that's good enough. Legally, I'll be given the opportunity of doing a follow-up if there is one. Currently, I'm training for a career in graphic design and commercial art, but not if a film comes along. After the movie, he was very rarely heard of. I can only find one questionable interview online, as well as that quote, there's no other coverage, nothing. Unfortunately, he wouldn't appear in the sequel and suffered from sickle cell anemia. Just months after his 39th birthday, he fell ill and passed away in Nigeria on December the 22nd, 1992. Shooting of Alien began on July the 5th, 1978, and wrapped up on October the 21st that same year in Shepperton Studios near London, England. Shooting would cause a lot of tension as writer Dan O'Bannon wasn't popular with the studio and at one point yelled at director Ridley Scott in front of the entire crew. Furthermore, Scott had nine producers on set monitoring everything, constantly judging him if he took too long with each take, and after release, the studio was sued by A.E. Van Vogt for plagiarism of his 1939 story Discord in Scarlet. Editing took around 20 weeks and Terry Rawlings went for a slow pace to build suspense and build more tension. I think the way we did get it right was by keeping it slow, funny enough, which is completely different from what they do today. And I think the slowness of it made the moments that you wanted people to be sort of scared, then we could go as fast as we liked because you suck people into a corner and then attack them, so to speak, and I think that's how it worked. The original cut was three hours and 12 minutes long. One of the many scenes that were dropped were Ripley discovering her fellow crew members during her escape and they were cocooned and reserved for the alien's food. It was cut because it wasn't realistic and it slowed the escape sequence down majorly. The picture had to have that pace, her trying to get the hell out of there. We're all rooting for her to get out of there, for her to slow up and have a conversation with Dallas just wasn't appropriate. There is an explanation for this, you know. Leading up to the movie's release, a novelization by Alan Dean Foster was published, both an adult and a junior version. How the hell do you make a junior version of this? I don't know yet. Heavy Metal Magazine published a comic strip adaptation and a calendar, two behind the scenes books followed in 1979, action figures, board games, Halloween costumes and video games were all spawned from this classic picture. The movie was originally screened in St. Louis, Missouri but failed due to poor sound in the theatre, but thankfully the second one in Dallas, Texas went a lot better and scared the shit out of the entire audience and was released on May the 25th, 1979. Allegedly, during the first screening, the scene where Ash gets decapitated and Usher actually fainted, some religious zealots actually set fire to a model of the alien calling it the work of the devil. I bet the exorcist went down well then. You have my sympathies. Now, on its initial release, the reviews were actually mixed. The film is an empty bag of tricks whose production values and expensive trickeries cannot disguise imaginative poverty. It's basically just an intergalactic haunted house thriller set inside a spaceship and it's one of several science fiction pictures that were real disappointments. Ebert did however compliment the exploration scene on the alien planet calling it real imagination and later put it on his great movies list, gave it four stars and called it a great original. My opinion has drastically changed. What the hell is that? Alien went on to gross an insane $80,931,801 in the United States alone. It won an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects, a Saturn Award for Best Science Fiction Film, Best Director for Ridley Scott and Best Supporting Actress for Veronica Cartwright, and a Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation. The movie is great. It, it really, really is. I don't think it's as scary as everybody says, but it is really, really good. I just want to address the weird little elephant in the room here. So apparently there was actually a lot of sexual overtones in this movie. Yeah, apparently the alien had a dripping vaginal mouth and the implantation was a metaphor for sexual intercourse. Okay, I am the dirtiest minded guy alive. And I never thought any of that shit while watching it. Why don't you just fuck off? But just to ruin the film for you, shredded condoms were actually used to create the tendons for the alien's jaws, KY jelly was used for its slime, and an early draft of the script, and I swear, I am not making this up. An early draft of the script had the alien actually, and I'm quoting the writer, fuck Kane to implant him. Oh, and Ripley and Lambert were meant to have a lesbian relationship, but forget all that. Alien rape?
It's not my contract to do this kind of duty. Now, I'll say that it's not scary, but before I get to why, it does have some really creepy moments and the suspense is built so well. By the way, why the hell did they bring a cat on the trip? And how did it close the door behind itself anyway? Look, the cat even just watches as the alien eats the guy. A dog would have saved him. I know that. The film does, I think, drag a bit at first, especially with boring sci-fi mumbo jumbo. It's almost primordial. There's in a nitrogen high concentration of carbon dioxide crystals, methane, I'm working on the trace elements. Anything else? Yes, it's rock, lava base. Deep cold, well below the line. Oh, thank God I don't care. But once it gets going, it gets really good. That is so simple, but so creepy. Even just the opening titles are creepy as hell and set the tone for the rest of the movie. The set designs of the ships and the alien and everything are so detailed and so impressive, but I think where the movie shines other than the suspense is the incredible special effects. When the alien bleeds acid, the effects are tremendous. This was thought up by conceptual artist Ron Cobb because the writer couldn't think of a reason why they wouldn't just shoot the alien. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Thank you. The alien looks amazing and they did a great job only partially showing the monster throughout until the final reveal, leaving most of it to the viewer's own imagination. It looks so real and that's where most movies fail nowadays with shitty CGI. Now, let's talk about the scene that we all want to talk about. This is one of the most famous movie scenes ever. And guess what? I don't find it scary, and it's not because of its time, I find the haunting terrifying from 1963. But just watch the delivery of it. <laughs> <laughs> is that acceptable to you? Now there were stories about what was or wasn't told of the actors beforehand, so let's just clear this up. They did know the monster was going to come out of Kane's chest, but they were unaware of the blood spurting everywhere, so the screams and shouts of hysteria are all legitimate reactions, which adds to the realism, so we'll give it that, but there's no music, and that's one issue I have with this film. Now, sometimes it doesn't need music, like here. <laughs> It builds the tension nicely and it doesn't need a score, but big action scenes like this, without music, it just looks hilarious. And since it's one of the biggest scenes in movie history, I'm gonna make fun of it. Hello. Apparently the acting was actually so good in this scene that Sigourney Weaver thought something had gone wrong and she thought that John Hurt was actually... Hurt. Huh? Huh? Seriously though, that, that is really impressive. On a serious note, on January the 25th, 2017, John Hurt became the first member of the main cast to die in real life, just like he was in the movie. I'd head for the hills if I was the rest of them. The issue happens here too. How cringy is this without music? <laughs> Something, man. While we're on this scene, this is where one of the bollocks rewrites came about. The movie has a subplot where it's revealed that Ash is trying to lure the alien onto the ship to take it back home, risking all of their lives, and even more far-fetched, he's a robot! Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah, sure. Bullshit. Now, writer Dan O'Bannon completely hated this idea and called it an unnecessary subplot, which it is. I mean, what, a story about space travellers who come across an alien and starts picking them off one by one? That wasn't enough of a story for you. It just wasn't needed. Why add it? It's entirely pointless. The acting can be quite questionable at times, especially from Sigourney Weaver. A transmission? Out here? An acting class? Out here? You'll get whatever's coming to you. I'll act whatever's coming to you. We could die in 24 hours, open the hatch. Listen to me, if we break quarantine, we could all die. Oh, Jesus Christ, show an emotion, Sigourney! It's weird, because as the film progresses and gets to the more intense, hysterical chase scenes, which I'd imagine would be a lot harder to pull off, her acting gets a hell of a lot better. Until we have it cornered, and then we'll blow it the fuck out into space. But she's not even the only problem. Ash, can you see this? Yes, I can. I've never seen anything like it. You can tell by the lack of emotion in my voice. I know he's supposed to be a robot, but it's not exactly keeping it hidden very well.
The movie was originally a lot bloodier, but was supposed to end with Ripley's escape, but Ridley Scott wanted a surprise fourth act added on. However, he wanted the alien to bite her head off, then sit in the chair as Sigourney's voice talks no, over- No, 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 no. You had a really cool idea there until you had the alien talk with Sigourney Weaver's voice. Just no. You get what you contracted for like everybody else. But the studio would only allow the last scene if the alien died. Regardless, the movie is great at building suspense. You can see the amount of influence this film had in the future. Movies like Jurassic Park ripped off scenes from this, and it really did take the world by storm. So many other movies tried this whole no one can hear you scream in space shtick like in Sunshine, and no matter how good they might be, they just won't ever capture the same charm or impact that this one had. I'm usually not keen on the flickery light style of direction, but it worked here in many scenes, and if you play the film after the credits, you can hear the sound of a pod opening hinting a sequel which actually followed. And that's a film we'll be talking about another time. What do you think of the Alien franchise? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you all next time.